good morning, everybody. I know that it's been a great morning of hearing from some of the world's biggest titans, and this is no exception. It's an honor to be here with a man who needs no introduction, Wall Street legend and head of $5.3 billion Galaxy Digital. Mike Novogratz is one of the most vocal and committed backers of cryptocurrencies to date. Since launching in 2018, Galaxy has been at the forefront with over 1,000 institutional partners and 100 unique crypto assets. And of course, what was a huge moment, he was also amongst the first to issue a Bitcoin ETF to the market just a few weeks ago. So Mike, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you. So Mike, you were on this stage a year ago and needless to say, the world looked pretty different. Give us a 30,000 foot view of where we are from a macro perspective and also from an industry perspective. Sure, so from a crypto perspective, you know, we came out of uh, the Fed changing policy in, in, in 2021 and starting to hike rates aggressively. And so you would think hard assets like crypto and, and, and gold uh, would go down, and they did. What accelerated that was all the fraud and bad behavior in the space. And so you had FDX and Celsius and uh, just an embarrassment of bad, bad participants. Uh, and so crypto is built on trust, and we lost a lot of trust. And so you had what's a classic market capitulation. Everybody hated it. You couldn't sell enough. Everyone deleveraged. No one's ever going to touch it again. And so when there's complete blood on the streets and markets, it's when you're supposed to come in and buy. It's very scary. Uh, you might look like an idiot. Uh, but that's when the greatest buying opportunities were. So Bitcoin at 18, 17,000, you know, with hindsight, was a great buying opportunity. So what switched? How did we go from all those headwinds to tailwinds? First, the Fed got closer to finishing their rate hike cycle, right? They're hiking, they're hiking, they're hiking. They're not going to hike forever. And so you could sense and then see the pause, and now we're going to start the rate cutting cycle. And so that was the macro tailwind. Um, you had a weird combination of good things happen, right? Grayscale, which was this big closed-end fund full of Bitcoin, uh, sued the SEC and said, this is unfair, you won't let an ETF happen. And they won. The reason we have an ETF is not because Gary Gensler decided, I really love crypto now, or the, the Biden administration, is because they lost in the courts. Uh, we have three parts of government, and thank God for the courts in terms of the crypto industry. And so, all of a sudden, we're going to get an ETF. Larry Fink, one of the most influential asset managers in history, came out and said, hey, this thing called Bitcoin, I know I used to think it didn't serve a purpose, but it's pretty important. And so the fact that Larry Fink got orange-pilled, monstrously important, right? Because it represented institutional investors everywhere. Uh, there are lots of different players, but he, he holds a unique post as the head of the largest asset manager in the world. Um, and all of a sudden, crypto's always been about a macro story and adoption you could start sensing oh, adoption is going to come. And so people start front running that. Uh, we also cleared up FTX, I'm sorry, Binance, right? The biggest crypto exchange in the world is Binance. There were all this worry, is the money there? CZ, CZ settled with the, with the government for some KYC fines, paid a huge fine, and stepped down. And so the risk around Binance, the biggest player, went from here to here, right? So now it's an exchange, it's still the largest exchange, but no one thinks, oh, it's gonna get shut down in a week. No one thinks they don't have the money. It's just a, an offshore player. And so we took a lot of the, the tail risks away and put, a, and put a tailwind to get. And now you got a position where, hmm, what's left to really get us going? Well, the US still is in a stalemate on regulation. Uh, but the optimism is there's 11 months left to an election. And no matter who wins, Democrats or Republicans, Gary Gensler is not going to be the SEC chair. Uh, you are going to get some legislation. You're going to get movement. And when, when I go to DC, there is bipartisan agreement on you know, two pieces of legislation. It's being blocked by Elizabeth Warren and Gary Gensler and a few other players. Uh, but that will change. And so when I look at crypto now, when I look at the whole industry, I'm like, hmm, we're gonna get regulation in the next 12 to 18 months. We're gonna have the Fed cutting rates, and we've got this new vehicle of adoption that is just getting started, right? The ETF is two weeks old. 
Usually ETFs get announced and they don't start trading for six to seven weeks. So they give the sales forces a ton of time to be able to go make their phone calls. In this case, because of the grayscale thing, they had one day. And so if you're the Invesco sales force, you haven't even started making your calls or BlackRock or now we've got nine big sales forces, huge sales forces that are selling Bitcoin. And that's a big, big deal. And that's on the back of a very strong year for Bitcoin, right? Like we talked about, I think up, what, over 150%. And part of that really is, for those that don't know, is about that limited circulation, right? I think like over 70% of the supply was not changing hands. Yeah. Why is that? So Satoshi Nakamoto, when she wrote her paper, she was really writing it as a response to what they, she saw, or they saw, uh, I'm gonna be really... Uh, per, per, uh, Do you know something you don't know? <laughs> I just like to, to make Satoshi female. It just makes me feel better. Um, that populism was coming, right? The white paper really is the guard of populism. And what we have seen since is the two most populist presidents of the last 40 years, right, Donald Trump, and then Joe Biden, right? Trump increased government spending a staggering amount before COVID and then blew the doors off. And Biden has just said, hey, my turn now. And so we have normalized spending 25% of GDP on the federal government. I worked at the Office of Management Budget in 1984, to tell you how old I am. Um, and I was working for the David Stockman administration, the Reagan administration. David Stockman was the head of the OMB. And I learned, hey, this is the rules. The feds get to spend 20% and try to tax 20%. And they usually tax less than 20%. And so our budget deficit is usually because we tax 16 and we spend 20. And that's Republican administration, uh, Democratic administration. The only time we balanced the budget was 1999 with Bill Clinton because we had those tech receipts. And we got there briefly. Right? But that's the framework we've used. And all of a sudden, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, voila, we're at 25%. Look at next year's budget projection, it's 26%. And we're not even taxing 18. So we have this giant deficit that's being funded. We have a fiscal crisis in this country that is not going away. And when I go to DC, they're doing nothing about it. Like you say, we need a Simpson Bowles bill. For the guys old enough to remember Simpson Bowles, it was a balanced budget. How do we get the, the budget back in, in check? Uh, it's not on the agenda. Why do you think that is? Why is it not on the agenda? <sighs> you know, we went through this period of low rates where it felt like money could grow on trees. And, right, modern monetary theory, Elizabeth Warren, money grows on trees. There are still plenty of people that think this, this works. And it felt like it did work, right? We had low interest rates and low inflation for a long period of time. What people forget is when you have inflation like we had the last three years, the just devastation it does to uh, most people in the country. Forget the top, the people that come to this conference are lucky enough or smart enough to get managers that can kind of navigate around it. But in 2010, the average house in America cost $189,000. That's, 2010 was like a three iron away from here. Uh, we're now 2024, and the average house costs $400,000. Wow. We've doubled the price of the average house in America in like 12 years. That is staggering. So if you're a young kid coming out of college, you're like, ah, oh, shit. Because uh, they didn't double the salaries, right? Goldman didn't go from paying their analyst 140 grand to 280 grand, let alone you know, white uh, blue collar jobs uh, or, or normal white collar jobs, uh, right? And so this inflation of assets, the inflation of goods, mm -hmm. crushes America. And it's why we have more populism now. Mm -hmm. It's why Donald Trump still gets 38% of the vote every single poll because that group of people feel like nothing's working for me and screw you people in DC. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're in this cycle. I don't know what gets out. When I say Hail Mary's at night, the one potential salvation is that AI is just so transformative that it becomes the greatest productivity boost in modern history. And we have such a productivity boost that inflation stays low and we can 
continue to run these giant deficits because they don't cost anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a very narrow target. I think AI is going to have a big impact, mm -hmm. but I think that it could just show up everywhere in, in time is, is a low probability. I love how you're laying this macroeconomic framework, and but I want to kind of get back to Bitcoin as kind of this store of value and beacon of hope, right? So we have these spot Bitcoin ETFs, right? You issued one of them that went to market two, three weeks ago, and you've been a big proponent of adoption and kind of leading the charge on the Bitcoin wagon early days. Tell us what this means broadly for the industry, like kind of at the same time as we're dealing with inflation, we're dealing with all of this fiscal deficit, all of these, you know, the, the widening of the inequality gap, Bitcoin can kind of now serve a retail base in a new and different way. Yeah, listen, I mean, the reality is it was always complicated to buy crypto, to buy Bitcoin, right? You had to set up a, a wallet. You had to set up a Coinbase account. You had, to, you had to do something different than you used to do. And it started as a young person's revolution. The bulk of the money in the world and the bulk of the money in the United States is held by the baby boomers. And the baby boomers in general talk to RIAs, registered investment advisors, to manage their money. The ETF is the product designed for registered investment advisors. You know? And so we are now plugging in to this giant group of RIAs. Mm -hmm. right? Bitcoin has always been sold, not bought. You had to tell someone the story. They call it orange pilling. I sit down with you and explain why I think it's important. Right? And in the long run, the technology of Bitcoin doesn't give it its value. It's as wild and cool as the breakthroughs were. I could take the Bitcoin blockchain. I could, I could fork it, which is just split it in half and call it the Novo chain, and it probably wouldn't even be worth that much. Uh, same technology. Right? What gives Bitcoin its value is the social construct. I say it has value, you say it has value, therefore it has value. It's the same thing as gold. It is, you know, it's not like gold has inherent value. It's valuable because we have a social construct around it. It's why it drives me crazy when guys like Jamie Dimon or Elizabeth Warren. I was going to ask, yeah. Well, you put Jamie Dimon and Elizabeth Warren in the same bucket these days. It's kind of funny. It says, well, I don't think it has value. I'm like, well, I don't care what you think because I got 180 million people that think it has value, including Ray Dalio and Jeff Yass and Pete Brigger and Stan Druckenmiller. And I was like, I take their track records over yours, Jamie. Uh, and so you don't need the whole world to think it has value. You just need more people and more money to think it has value. And what I see is going to happen is every RIA is going to finally say, hey, you should put one or two percent. Like, well, it's, it's like a stock allocation. And there's a huge pool of capital that hasn't even touched it yet. And so that's what you're going to see coming through the, the ETFs. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that next jolt. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the outflows too, right? There's still a very volatile space. Um, so <laughs> Not for what the are you seeing there, right, with um, Grayscale? Listen, Grayscale had a product that allowed people access. It was a shocking to me that the, the SEC, who cared about the consumer, allowed that product through because it was broadly a closed-end fund with no way of, of, of closing the discount with very high fees. So consumers at times bought at a premium to the underlying. Uh, that went to a giant discount. Uh, and it was a terrible consumer retail product. It was a terrible institutional product. Uh, it was a great product for hedge funds to arbitrage. Right? They made a fortune when it was trading at a premium, uh, and they made a fortune when it was trading at a discount. And so, you know, shout out to the guys at Grayscale for making hedge funds a lot richer. Um, but if I was the SEC, why in God's name did I approve that product? And so now that, you know, it's, the arbitrage is gone, people are like, ah, I didn't have a grand experience. Mm -hmm. uh, they have higher fees, much higher fees than Invesco or BlackRock or Fidelity. So if I'm not tax driven, instantly I'm shifting over. Mm -hmm. A lot of people bought the thing at a great discount. They made enough money. They said, let me just move on and move on in life. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing that, sure, and it's slowing down, right? But I don't, I don't think any new money is going to come in a grayscale uh, unless they do something dramatically different to rebuild trust and lower fees. 
And I think you're going to see that money still drift into the other ETFs. Mm -hmm. And so that's a whole lot of money, right? I mean, BlackRock and Fidelity have created a, a $2 billion ETF faster than any other ETFs in history. And so hats off, right? Uh, and so there's no way to see this as anything but a success. Mm -hmm. But Grayscale's lost, right. you know. But the, that's in any competitive market, right? So you said that there's going to be two or three winners. You mentioned BlackRock. Who are going to be some of the other winners that you Well, listen, we, we started this thing with Invesco. Uh, we've off, off to a slower start than we'd like to be. I like to think, give this six months to get their sales force, get it on the platforms. All this stuff takes so much more time than I would have thought it would or hoped. Right, to get on the Morgan Stanley platform, you're, it's a whole process before they feel comfortable selling it to all their clients. And I think that you'll see that happen over the next six months and then we'll be able to see. Listen, BlackRock and Fidelity are definitely gonna be in that group. Mm -hmm. Who's next? You know, there's Bitwise, there's um, uh, uh, ARC uh, and Invesco, I think us three and we're, we're in third place right now of that second group. That's not bad. It's only been two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And so the funniest, the other funny part is these businesses are important in terms of asset gathering and, but they're not that profitable. Like the fees are really low. And so they're, they're great consumer products. They really are great consumer products. Uh, and at huge scale, they're great products for, but they're branding. Right, but do you think that that is going to drive more retail demand in, right? Yes, yeah. 100%. Yeah. 100%. And it's going to change the dynamic a little bit, right? You can get leverage on your Bitcoin ETF, right? It's, now it's just a stock. And so if you're short the Bitcoin miners versus long the ETF, it's a much more capital efficient trade than it used to be, right? Because you, you have your assets at the same broker. Uh, as opposed to you got Bitcoin over here and, and your stocks over here. And so I think you're going to see more leverage come into the space just because one of the things that broker dealers do is give leverage. And now they've got something that they'll be able to give leverage with. So where do you see growth being strongest, though, over the next 12 months as you forecast it out a little bit? I think you're going to see this institutional creep. It's going to start with the RAAs. Uh, but listen, adoption always happens in a relatively similar way. Uh, you already have some early, you know, early movers in the in the pension pension world, uh, in the in the endowment world. Now I can say I'm not going to get fired. It's not that complex. It's it's just like a stock, and you're going to see some of those guys move in, and then they're going to say, well, what's next? The Ethereum ETF is coming, so maybe I should be part of that ecosystem. Hey, once we realize, and I think one of the most important things of this ETF is there is an inevitability that crypto is going to be part of the financial landscape. We are going to get legislation done in the next 18 months. You can talk to Hakeem Jeffries. You can talk to Tom Emmer on the other side. Republican and Democrat, they will tell you we're going to get legislation done. And so... Once this inevitability happens, it just makes it easier for other people to invest. And we're seeing that already. We're seeing that in our asset management business raising more capital. We're seeing that in signing up more clients to trade with us. Uh, it's not like a gold rush that you know, everyone's running like mania like we had in 17 and 21. But it's better for the long run that we have this slow move of the herd. And so... It would be surprising to me if the crypto business wasn't a lot bigger in two years than it was today. Mm -hmm. Well, do you think that the SEC is going to approve the Ethereum ETF next? I think they have to. Like the logic on the Bitcoin ETF was, and the judge was like, what are you talking about? You have a futures ETF, but you don't want a cash ETF because of some hocus pocus witchcraft? Shut up. And that's basically <laughs> what the, the court said to the SEC. And we already have a futures Ethereum ETF, and so that logic has to hold. Mm -hmm. And so I think almost by definition, you're going to see an Ethereum ETF. Do you think that logic translates to getting the Coinbase lawsuit thrown out? When are we going to see that? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, though I think there's a lot. Listen, we have a Supreme Court that is pushing on government overreach, right? We have a very conservative Supreme Court. They have been pushing on government overreach. This SEC 
has been reaching. You can call it a reach or not, but they've been reaching. And we will see how the courts do. I actually think the next head of the SEC, Republican or Democrat, are going to drop so many of these lawsuits that Gensler has, has issued because you see the inevitability of where they're going to go. And that doesn't look good. I am sympathetic that it's very complicated to decide what's a security and what's, what's a, a, a commodity or what's not a security. We have a, uh, the Howey test. It's old, old legislation. These are new technologies. And so it's disingenuous for Gary Gensler to say, oh, the rules are so clear. Right. If the rules were clear, we wouldn't have two different courts you know, saying the exact opposite about what works. The rules are nothing but clear. It is costing our industry money. It's costing me personally and my company tons of money trying to decide where to put people, where to start businesses. And so it's imperative that Congress and the White House gets together and, and just make some clearer guide rules. Um, you know, people say, oh, all the businesses go offshore. Well, business is moving offshore, but it, more importantly, it's slowing down the whole growth of an industry. That, mm -hmm. that is gonna happen anyway. Right. On that note, you said that you, because of the regulatory challenges here in the U.S., you were going to be significantly moving some of your operations overseas. I mean, what a huge loss to America. Can you talk a little bit about, like, what you're going to be doing in the interim? We're expecting regulation in the next 18 months, but... Yeah, listen, it's, it's unbelievably frustrating. Uh, if I was younger and didn't have my own assets to protect and was a little bit more of a rebel... I look like a rebel in my white suit, but I'm actually pretty conservative. <laughs> I would probably, like a lot of the crypto companies did, flip the bird and just do what I wanted to do. Uh, right? So you have a lot of people doing things thinking, yeah, well, Coinbase is going to win anyway, therefore I'm going to... And even Coinbase, they are doing things that they believe are fair, but the SEC says they're not. Well, when you're a more conservative company or you only deal with institutional clients, you don't want to get foul of the SEC. You don't want a Wells notice. You don't want a lawsuit. A, it costs a fortune to fight. B, your clients get nervous. And so a lot of companies like ours are living in this in-between land of not having clear rules. And so we're moving some of our business to the Bahamas, to Hong Kong, to London. Uh, I would tell you some of that we would move anyway because we're going to grow those areas. But if I had clarity in the US, a lot of that would be sitting in my New York office because I like things close. Uh, and so it's the lack of clarity that's a cost. Right. That's There's a cost. huge tax on crypto companies in America. It comes through our lawyers. It comes through our accountants. We pay three times for our audit what we would if we were a non-crypto company. And so, like, you got a $9 million audit for a small company like Galaxy, or not so small company, but, like, a, you know, we're a medium-sized company. Like, that audit at a normal place would be $3 million. So it's like a $6 million crypto tax because our government keeps putting the fear. Mm. It's crazy. Crazy. Um, so we have a couple minutes left. I want to, we touched on this in the beginning. I want to shift back to the kind of ma macroeconomic market landscape, inflation, rate cuts. What's your outlook, soft landing? What's your outlook for 2024? Listen, inflation is coming down and the Fed is going to cut rates. Should they cut rates or not? That's a different story. The Fed is going to cut rates because inflation is coming down. It's coming down pretty quick. Um, and I think that's a good thing. I still think they'll cut in March, though. The data's not rolling over. And you know why is the data not rolling over? Why is the economy still strong? One is, we're not used to 25% government spending. When the government goes out and says, hey, we're going to spend on infrastructure, that's not interest rate sensitive. The government spends it, right? It, it, and so moving rates up doesn't slow government spending down. Anybody in this room who started in 1980 or afterwards, all their models, if they're an econometric modeler or if they're just models in their head, are based on a government that mean reverts to 20% federal spending. We're not used to 25% federal spending. And so I think some of this stubborn growth is, it's just the government's funding it. Mm -hmm. um, some of it is we have still have a housing shortage in America, and we have an auto shortage, right? And so, like, listen, Ford and, 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 and the rest of the autos just settled a strike. Labor doesn't have the power to strike when, they, when their industry's in the shitter, right? Uh, 
the auto industry is strong enough that these guys could strike and they could get a great deal for themselves. And so when autos and construction don't collapse, those are job, those are big job places. In most recession, those are the guys that lead us into recession. Those are where the layoffs come. And so we're just not seeing a lot of layoffs. Mm -hmm. We saw layoffs at Microsoft, we saw layoffs at Google, we saw layoffs at Goldman Sachs. We're seeing Sachs layoffs in media. What? Yeah, we're seeing layoffs yeah. in media. But we're not seeing them in these big, bolt jobs, right? The construction industry is at a monster part of the economy, and that's not slowing, and we almost normally see it slow. And so it's going to be a different kind of slowdown. And the only reason the Fed's going to cut rates this year is inflation, not growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we talk, we're talking backstage, and the election is looming large in November, and you have an interesting philosophy, and do you think, well, I'm going to let you say. Listen, I, I always use this little quip, you know, I graduated college in 1987, but you don't really get into politics for a few years, so 1992, Bill Clinton gets elected. Bill Clinton, George Bush, Donald Trump born the same year within four months of each other, or five months of each other, right? That baby boomer generation uh, has been in power really for 35 odd years. And over that time, debt to GDP has gone from 50 to 125. Uh, so they've kind of bankrupted their grandkids. It's on its way to 250, if you just look where we're headed. Uh, America has gone from you know, well, the, the average American uh, is 35 pounds heavier, right? Mortality is down for the first time in history, right? Life expectancy is down. Uh, they've done a pretty shitty job running our country. Uh, the baby boomers who keep thinking, oh, you need me. I'm like, get the hell off the stage. There's, there's really a tremendous amount of evidence. My favorite statistic is this, when they took power, 16% of American seniors lived under the poverty line and 17% of American uh, children lived under the poverty line. Today, 70% of American children live under the poverty line, yet 4% of American seniors live under the poverty line. Right? They've paid for their hip replacement at the expense of their grandkids. And it's time for the baby boomer generation to clear that. That's Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, Chuck Schumer, all of them. Wipe them off the stage. So I basically said I'm never... Mm -hmm. Again, voting for anyone over 72. Uh, we need a new generation. We need someone from Gen X. I mean, I, 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 we had yeah. Dean Phillips on my podcast. Right. I don't think you Dean did Phillips a fundraiser is, for him. I don't think he's going to win, but he's so symbolic of what we should have in D.C. He's a good ethical guy. He's run businesses. He's in it for the right reasons. He didn't take PAC money. And so we really need to move beyond Trump and Biden, and it's an embarrassment when I travel abroad, people are like, what the hell is going on in America? Uh, and listen, I, I don't know how this election is gonna turn out. I, I got in trouble because I, I say Hail Mary that they both pass away quietly in their sleep. And uh, <laughs> people thought that was very rude. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's, we are in this weird log jam, but we need something to change, um, period. Period, okay, so we got 20 seconds left, lightning round. Best, worst investment? In my life? Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I bought Ethereum when it was one, and it went to 4,000, and like a 4,000 Xer, you, you know, you, you bow. <laughs> you know? And so that's my best. That's investment. your best? Um, I sold Peloton, uh, you know, when it was, when Tire bought in, and I had turned my day one investment of $300,000 into six million and I thought this is so great. And my friends who were on the board told me not to sell it. The CEO said don't sell it. But I was like, hey, I got another guy that's telling me to sell and I just hired him and I hate disappointing people. And so I listened to my new guy and that would have been worth 300 million at the high. Oh, wow. Well, so, I don't think you're hurting. But I thought you were gonna say Luna because of the tattoo. You know, <laughs> my, my dumbest idea <laughs> was putting a tattoo on the internet. My daughter warned me, she said, Dad, don't put that on the internet. I said, yeah, but I told the guys I'd get a tattoo if I got to 100, and, and that was really not a, not a good idea. Is the tattoo here to stay? I love the tattoo. It reminds me that, uh, you know, markets go up and markets go down, and this is a really difficult business. Uh, yes, listen, we, we actually made a bunch of money on Luna because the way I have approached 
most venture and most crypto is these are such young ideas that when things get to, you know, when you make a lot of money, you start taking chips off the table the whole way up. And I know the classic venture guy says it could be the next Google. And I'm always like, I got one Google, one Microsoft, one, like, they're not a lot of Googles and they're all monopolies. Like, how do you know these things are going to be monopolies? They've been around for 18 months. And so I have, if I have done something well in my experience in venture and crypto, it's not been I bought so well, it's that I've sold. Mm -hmm. And it's the one advice I give to people is, you make 10x on something, take 30% off. Take, you know, like, just scale out. Because we're in a world where the idea of what money is has changed. The idea of, I mean, we, we literally, like, if you had told me that Dogecoin was still going to be a thing three years later, <laughs> I would have thought, no. But the young generation sees this as their gambling, their speculating, their identity, and they're getting more and more money. Mm -hmm. And it ain't going away. I mean, dog with hat. If any of you got a dog with hat, it was a, I thought it was like my, my, my son-in-law was teasing and he made a fortune on it and it became a thing and you know these memes uh, we we changed the way people thought about money by making it free and giving it all away and so I don't think that's a, a temporary thing I think it's going to be a come and go and so you're going to see these wild bubbles and volatility that are going to be part of our landscape for a while well on that note we're out of time but Mike thank you so much for joining us